Respected brothers and sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A Sayyida Khadija alayha salam is no doubt the greatest wife of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. She is the first woman to ever believe in Rasulullah and she is one of the four greatest women of all time that Allah ever created. And when we examine the history and the legacy of a Sayyida Khadija alayhi salam, we find many lessons that we can learn from her. Lessons of altruism and sacrifice, for example, because there is no one that sacrificed and gave like Khadija alayhi salam gave to Allah. What she gave to Rasulullah, what she gave to Islam cannot be matched by any other of the Sahaba. This is the legacy of a Sayyida Khadija. When you look at the marriage of a Sayyida Khadija alayhi salam to Rasulullah, you find many lessons we can learn from her marriage because it was indeed an exemplary marriage that we should all try to emulate in our lives. Because when we speak about successful marriages, we tend to always focus on the marriage of Imam Ali alayhi salam and Fatima al Zahra. And of course, there is no doubt that the marriage of Imam Ali and Fatima al Zahra is an outstanding an example for every single one of us when we want to seek inspiration in marriage. But the question is to ask, who raised Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam? Who did she learn from? Who raised Amir al Mu'mineen? It was Khadija that raised Fatima and Imam Ali that was raised in the house of Rasulullah. Thus, when you see that the marriage of Ali and Fatima was successful, there is no surprise because they followed in the footsteps of the marriage of Khadija and Rasulullah. As they say, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. And that's why when we examine this beautiful marriage of Khadija and Rasulullah, we find so many beautiful lessons that we can apply in our lives. Tonight, I'd like to examine the marriage of Prophet of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi to a Sayyida Khadija alayhi salam. And then I would like to extract some lessons that we can derive, that we can apply in our lives from their marriage. A Sayyida Khadija alayhi salam, how did she get to know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? How did she meet him? Because back then, obviously, there was no Facebook, you would agree, correct? See, many of our youth today, they're turning to Facebook, they're turning to Twitter, they're turning to Instagram, they're turning to TikTok, social media, so that they can meet their spouse. You ask many of the youth, how did you get married? How did you meet this youngly, lovely, uh, youngly, uh, this lovely young lady? They will tell you, you know what? There was, a, for example, a post I saw on social media. There was a like, and then there was a message, and then an interaction, and then we got married. But during the time of Rasulullah, there was no social media. So how did Khadija alayhi salam meet Rasulullah? And because likewise, there was no social media, it was also not an arranged marriage marriage because many times we would imagine that in the earlier history it was all arranged marriages correct it was chosen for you to marry this person the marriage of Khadija to Rasulullah was very unique in that it was not arranged it was the choice of Khadija alayhi salam that she wanted to marry Rasulullah and it was his choice that he wanted to marry Khadija without the parents without any of the family members intervening and them encouraging to get married. So that's why it was a very beautiful and unique marriage. How did Khadija know Rasulullah? Khadija alayhi salam, as we know, she's very wealthy, the wealthiest woman in Arabia. It all began with a business venture that she had. She was looking for a business partner. She has the wealth. She has a caravan of goods that's supposed to go to Sham and do trade. She needs a business partner. And as you know, anyone who's done business, anytime you look for a business partner, it's not just someone that has the skills. It has to be likewise someone that is what? Trustworthy. You can trust them with your money, with the business. You can trust them with the work. Khadija alayhi salam is looking for someone that is ameen, someone that is sadiq. 
who is better in Quraysh than Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi? Because he had the reputation of a sadiq al amin Everyone knew him in Quraysh to be trustworthy, to be honest, to the extent that when someone in Quraysh wanted to travel, they would entrust their money with Rasulullah. Now, we put our money in the banks. Back then, there were no banks. So when you want to go on a long travel, maybe even with your family members, you want to place your money with someone that you trust. Most people, they would come to Rasulullah because they knew he was a sadiq al amin I remember a story that one day happened between Abu Jahl and Al-Walid. These were one of the two fiercest enemies and the opposition of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa wasallam. They were having a debate, discussion on Rasulullah. Is he truthful when he says, I'm a messenger? Or is he lying? Abu Jahl tells Al-Walid, he tells him, I know, wallahi, that Muhammad is honest. He's not lying. Al-Walid tells him, how do you know this? He says, because ever since he was a child, we used to call him a Sadiq al amin Since he was a child, everyone knew he was honest, trustworthy. He had never lied in his life. Now that he's grown older and he's mature, I come and I say that he is lying. He's making up a lie every single day. It doesn't make sense. So why did Abu Jahl then re reject Rasulullah? It was because of arrogance. He said, because I am from one tribe. And Muhammad is from another tribe. And I will never submit to someone from another tribe. It was the tribal mentality that prevented Abu Jahl from believing in Muhammad. Or else he knew that Prophet Muhammad was indeed the messenger of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Rasulullah was known in Quraysh as a sadiq al amin the best reputation. One day Rasulullah, it's narrated, went to buy a horse. He bought the horse from an Arabi. So he saw the horse, he liked it, and he set a price. The Arabi accepted, the transaction was done, the deal was finished. Rasulullah went to bring the money. The Arabi is just waiting to collect the money. This is after Rasulullah becomes the messenger. So he's waiting. Some of the munafiqeen, the hypocrites, they envied Rasulullah. So they went and they tried to break that transaction. They went to him, they told him, Muhammad has scammed you. Why? Because your horse is worth, is worth much more. Let's say, for example, that the price was set at 50 dinars. They told him, your horse is worth 100, 150. He says, what do I do now? They told him, when he comes, tell him that the price that we agreed on was not 50, was 150. Change it. I'm giving an example. So he said, I just lied. They said, yes, lie to him. Tell him he will give you more. So the Holy Prophet comes back with the money. He gives him the money. The Arabi says, this is not the price that we agreed on. Rasulullah says, yes, this is the price we agreed on. He says, no. The Prophet says, yes. He says, no. All of a sudden, one of the companions of Rasulullah comes by the name of Khuzayma ibn Thabit. Khuzayma ibn Thabit comes and he says, Ya Rasulullah, I testify, I am a witness that the price that you are mentioning is right. Rasulullah tells him, but you were not there when we did the transaction. You never saw, you never heard. How are you witnessing to something you were not present? Khuzayma ibn Thabit, look at his iman in Rasulullah. He tells him, Ya Muhammad, I trust you with my faith, with my akhirah. I believed you when you told me there is a God. I believed you when you told me there is Jannah, there is Nar. You don't want me to believe you about a horse, the price of a horse? Of course I believe you because you are a sadiq al amin You never lie about anything. This is when Rasulullah as reported, he says Khuzayma is the shahadatain, meaning that he is one person, but his testimony equals the testimony of two people. That's why anytime you have a quarrel, you need witnesses, usually two, Khuzayma, if he comes in witnesses, he suffices for two. He's one person whose testimony equals two individuals. So this story highlights that Rasulullah had a beautiful reputation in Quraysh. He was known as a Sadiq al amin Khadija alayhi salam knows that Muhammad is honest. Muhammad is trustworthy. And I can trust him with this business venture. So that's why she sends a request to the Prophet, I want you to be a business partner. 
I have the money, the caravan of goods. You go to Sham and you do business. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam needed money because he was not wealthy. So he accepted. Khadija still has never met Muhammad. She's only interacted with him through people, other individuals. The Holy Prophet then sets out with the caravan to Sham. Khadija sends one of her servants by the name of Maysara. She tells him, go with Muhammad on this trip. And he wasn't there just to help him in the business deal. The point of why she sent Maysara was that so she monitors Muhammad. So that he monitors Muhammad. He assesses him. Is he really as they speak? Because sometimes there are people who have a good reputation. But when you come and you see them, you see they're not as good as people speak, right? Exaggerations. Other times, no, you find that these people are, what? Are underappreciated. People do not appreciate this person as they should. So she sends Maysara and he's supposed to evaluate and assess the character of Rasulullah. Because Khadija alayhi salam is likewise what? Searching for a husband. Just like many of our youth they're searching for husbands. They're searching for wives. Khadija alayhi salam wants to get married. She is between the age of 25 to 28. Anywhere between this. And many people had come and proposed to her. Abu Jahl proposed to her. Abu Sufyan proposed to her. But yet no. Khadija alayhi salam wants the right person. So Rasulullah goes with Maysara and they come back. After they come back, Maysara goes and reports to Khadija. And he tells her, Ya Khadija, I saw wonders from this man Muhammad. He is truly a treasure. He's a gem in his discipline, in his akhlaq, in his respect, in his integrity, in his honesty. Indeed, he is a sadiq al amin Oh Khadija, Muhammad is an angel. He is a saint. So he gives this news to Khadija and Khadija starts to feel that what? This is the right person for me to what? To get married to. Because now not only the reputation, now I have tried him and he has proven to be a noble individual. Many lessons to be learned from this brothers and sisters. Lesson number one that we learn from Khadija when it comes to searching for our spouses is that you have to number one, look amongst a family where they have a noble reputation. When you want to find a spouse, whether a boy, a girl, I'm looking for a son-in-law, I'm looking for a daughter-in-law, I'm a young guy, I'm searching for a girl, I'm a young girl, I'm searching for a guy. Search for someone that has good reputation in the community. Sometimes you go to some communities, you hear everyone talking against the family. Now, yes, sometimes it could be wrong. It could be dhulam against that family. But at the end of the day, don't search in areas where there is no good reputation. Search amongst people that have a good reputation. This is the first lesson that Khadija tells us. When you're so searching for your soulmate, make sure this person comes from what? A noble family. Why? Because they tell us that we are told that genes are inherited, correct? If you have a family that what? That they are generous, most likely their kids will be generous. And that's why you see the famous poem, Hatam al Ta'i was generous and his son Adi or Uday was generous. The poet says, I'm not surprised to see the son of Hatam al Ta'i generous because he took after his father. Now it's proven that these genes we pass them on. Imam Ali alayhi salam, when he wants a brave son, what does he tell his brother Aqil? He tells his brother Aqil, I want you to search a wife that comes from a brave family. Why? Because a brave family will breed will give birth to a brave son. And that's how Al-Abbas alayhi salam came to this dunya. And subhanAllah, I was reading that now scientists are discovering even intelligence. Intelligence is passed through genes, correct? You find someone intelligent, they say up to 50% of your intelligence can be taken from your father and especially from your mother. So that's why you look in noble families because these good traits are what are passed down. And likewise, bad traits, unfortunately, they are also passed down. This is number one. Number two, reputation by itself is not enough. 
Do not rely solely on reputation, Khadija teaches us. Muhammad was a Sadiq al Amin. The reputation was there. But did she say that's enough? No. Khadija, she what? She investigated. And that's why the second point that we have to keep in mind when we are soul searching is what? Reputation, check. Number two, do some investigations. Why? Because many times, as I said, there are people who have good reputations in the public, but unfortunately, privately, they have a different face, correct? Privately, you find something else. And that's why you have to investigate. Just because the father and the mother are good does not always mean the children, the son and the daughter will be good. You have to investigate. How do I investigate? Before, it may be a little difficult. You have to ask here and there. Now, the easiest way for you to investigate a prospect, a young man or a young woman, is how? Go and check their social media accounts. Subhanallah, they put everything on it. They put everything on it. Sometimes even some things where they are exposing themselves. Allah has sattar al ayub But because of social media, you find young people, they're exposing themselves. I see some young people when I travel to Majalis. And then... When I go on their social media accounts, I see la ilaha illallah, musibah. Look at the accounts they're following of female singers, inappropriate accounts, the pictures that they are liking, the pictures that they are putting, the content, the words that they are putting, the profanity. And it's all public on Facebook, on Instagram, on Snapchat. No one is exposing them. They are revealing themselves. And that's why I have read that some companies, when you apply to them, Correct? You want a job? What do they do? In order to assess your personality, they don't just ask you. What do they do? They go and check your Facebook. They go and check your social media accounts to see are you someone who behaves? Are you someone who is responsible or not? So one of the best ways that you can investigate and see if this person is, as they claim, is through their what? through their social media accounts. Some people, as soon as they have, some fathers, they have someone that comes to propose to their daughter. The first thing they do, they call the local sheikh, say it, please do an istikhara for me. Without doing any investigation, without asking, without knowing anything, right away, khira, istikhara. The ulama say, al khira and al khira. Khira is after you investigate. After you ask, go and check their accounts, ask other people, and then you still don't know, you do khira. But from day one, someone comes and proposes, I do khira without knowing anything, without investigating anything. This is wrong, brothers and sisters. We have to make it a habit to investigate. This is number two. And number three, the third and best way to know if this person is genuine or not is, is how? Is to test them. And this is not always possible. But if you test someone, then you can find out the true colors of that person. Correct? You see, Khadija alayhi salam didn't just rely on the reputation. She didn't just rely on, on asking. She tested Muhammad. And one of the best ways to test a person is how? And Imam al-Sadiq was asked, how do I know if someone is genuine? He's a true friend. Or I can, you know, you can also apply it to marriage. And Imam al-Sadiq said, test that person with money. Test that person with money. And ta'manhu ala malik. Then you know that this person is genuine. Because subhanAllah, how money sometimes reveals our true colors. Money reveals our true colors. You give someone, you want to test them, give them some money, right? And then a couple of months later, a month later, ask them to give you the money back. Will they give the money back or not? You know how many people, they come and tell me, Sayyid, I gave a loan to someone who used to come to the mosque. He asked me for a $5,000 loan, a $10,000 loan. He used to pray in the first line, فَصَفْ awwal. Masha Allah, the beard, the sibha is in his hand and he's wearing 17 rings on his fingers. So I what? I assume this is a mu'min, trustworthy. So he asked me one day for help. I give him qarv, I give him $10,000. And then when it's time to repay it, I call him, he blocks me. He blocks me. He does not reply. Is this person a true mu'min, brothers and sisters? 
This is not a true mu'min. And that's why the imams of Ahlul Bayt tell us, do not be fooled by appearances. Maybe someone comes and prays every Jum'ah. Maybe someone comes to every lecture. Is this an indicator that he's a true mu'min? No. How do you know he's a true mu'min? Test him with money. If you can entrust him or her with your money, with your family, with your kids, this is when you know this person is a mu'min. That's why there's a hadith from Rasulullah where he says, لا تنظروا إلى كثرة صلاتهم وكثرة صيامهم وكثرة الحج وطنطنتهم في الليل You want to test someone if he's a mu'min? Don't say, Wallah, mashallah, he prays. So what if he prays? Don't say, mashallah, he is fasting all of month of Rajab and Sha'ban. This is not a definitive indicator. I'm not trying to say these are not good deeds. These are good deeds. These are usually deeds that believers do. But is this a definitive indicator that this person is a believer? Rasulullah says no. Do not look at his salah, his hajj, his fasting. Even if he prays salat al -layl. Is this an indicator that this person is someone you can trust? This is a mu'min? No. The Prophet says, وَلَكِنْ انظروا إِلَى صِدْقِ الْحَدِيثِ وَأَدَاءِ الْأَمَانَةِ Two indicators, you know if this person is genuine. You know if this is a person you can trust your daughter's life with. You know this person is worthy of giving your daughter to or not. He says, صِدْقُ الْحَدِيثِ If he is honest, he does not lie. And number two, وَأَدَاءِ الْأَمَانَةِ If he is trustworthy. If you cannot trust someone with your money, you can trust them with your daughter. So one way to know if this person is genuine or not is how? It's through money. Test them through money, yes. Maybe even if it's a test. Tell them, you know what, this is a loan. A 1,000, a 5,000, a 10,000. Ask, you know, I we may joke about this. Ask about their credit score. Maybe this is a good idea. Some people fraud. Their entire history is fraud. They fraud, they defraud the uh, the banks, they defraud the insurance, they defraud the government. He's working, what, under the table taking cash, and he's taking welfare, and he's taking from his country in the Middle East. Also, he's taking some money. Can you trust this person? Wallahi, I would not trust this person with my daughter. I don't care how much salah he prays. Let him read the Quran every single day. But when he has no amana, when you cannot trust him with money, it's all fraud, fraud, fraud. I would not trust this person. So test, brothers and sisters, your prospect. Test the girl, test the guy. This is one way. Al Imam al Sadiq alayhi salam teaches us, Khadija teaches us. Test the person. And, and Khadija, subhanAllah, she tested Rasulullah with money. She did not take it for granted that he has a reputation of being a Sadiq al Amin. Remember, this is before he's a messenger. Rasulullah is 25 years old. This is 15 years before Jibra'il comes down. Rasulullah had good reputation. Did she just rely on that? No. Did she say, Wallah, he had a good father, he has a good uncle? No, no, no. She tested him and she tested him with money. And this is when she found out that Rasulullah is a true gem. This is a lesson for you and I. So number one, the first way you test someone to know if this is a good person to marry, to marry either I am the girl or I am the father, I want to accept this. Son-in-law as the husband of my daughter is through money. Number two, the second way you can test the true nature of someone is what? Is through traveling with them. Travel with that person. When you travel with someone, that trip, even if it's two, three days, will show, will show the true colors of that person. It will show the true colors of that person. Because many times, brothers and sisters, you find our youth, they're getting into marriages. They think this is a good person, a good guy, a good girl. But after that, they realize that they have been fooled. They have been deceived. Why? Because we human beings are smart actors. When we know we're being looked at, when we, we are being judged and evaluated, I know the father-in-law is looking at me. I sit like this, mashallah. When the girl is looking at me, I become Al-Muqaddas Al-Ardabili, correct? And the girl, she becomes, MashaAllah, Bintul Huda. She becomes an angel. Why? Because we are being looked at. This is human nature. And it's not just with marriage. You know, this is uh, one of the tendencies, the bad tendencies of human beings is that we do riya. Anytime we know people are looking at us, we love to do riya. There's even a funny story about this. They say one day, a young man came to the masjid. He wanted to pray. There's no one there. So he's praying. You know, when we pray privately, how fast we pray. Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar, Allah Akbar. People, I see their salah is like this. Salat al-Dhuhr and Asr to them takes three minutes. The whole Salat al-Dhuhr al-Asr, which at least should take ten minutes, correct? It takes because they read so fast. 
But when someone is looking, all of a sudden they become Abd al -Basit. So this young man, he, he comes, he's praying fast, all of a sudden two older men, they come. They come, so he knows there's people behind him, so he starts to slow down, he starts to read Tajweed, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Abd al-Basit, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. You want, to, you want to say Allah after that. So he starts to read Quran in the most beautiful way. He's slowly reading. So he catches the attention of those two individuals. They say, MashaAllah, MashaAllah, look at this shab. Look at this shab. He's such a mu'min. His tajweed, his qira'ah is so beautiful. His salah is so beautiful. One tells the other, I wish my son, I wish my daughter would learn from this individual. And you can imagine the smile on his face. They can't see his smile. He's so happy that he's being praised for acting. For acting, subhanAllah, this is how happy he is. So they praise him and praise him and he's losing patience. He's about to explode. How happy he is, they say in the middle of the salah. He broke his salah. He told them, don't forget that I'm fasting also. I'm fasting. So sometimes when we know people are looking at us, we become actors. So you may find the guy says, I went out with her on a date, two days, five dates. But I never saw this. Now that I got married, I'm seeing another face. I am, for example, discovering alarming things I never knew about. Or I am seeing, discovering certain traits that were not there when I was on those dates. When I used to go to the family, the family used to come in our house. So where did this come from? The problem is because we don't test. How do you test someone? We said through amana and number two, through trips. Travel with that person. I as a father-in-law, I want to see if this person is a gem, travel with him. As if you, and if you can afford it, tell him I will pay for your expenses. Let's go to Hajj together. Let's go to Ziyarah together. Let's go Asan, anywhere. Let's go to Hawaii. Let's go to anywhere you want to go. Three, four days and just monitor him. Exactly like how Maysara was monitoring Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Because when you travel, you truly, you truly find out the identity of people, their true colors. Sometimes when I travel, I realize some people are gems. I never knew this. I never knew this. I go to Hajj some years, and there are many people. I find out some people, you know, they, they live with me, for example, in the city, but I don't see them so much. When I go to Hajj, because every day I am with them, I realize that they are a gem. And sometimes the opposite. Sometimes we realize that some people who had a good reputation home, when you go to Hajj with them, you see this person is all false. No, this person is a terrible individual. So one of the benefits of traveling with someone is that you can know and discover their true identity. That's why Amir al-Mu'mineen alayhi salam, there is a beautiful poem that is attributed to him about traveling. Imam speaks about this. The Imam has been attributed to him. He says, تغرب عن الأوطان في طلب العلا. It's so beautiful and eloquent. He says, تغرب عن الأوطان في طلب العلا وسافر ففي الأسفار خمس فوائدي. He says that travel, he encourages traveling. Why? He says because there are five benefits when you travel. He says, تفرج هم واكتساب معيشة وعلم وآداب وصحبة ماجدي. He says because when you travel, number one, sometimes what? This is relief from the stress of home and work. So go out and have fun. You know, go to a vacation as long as it is halal. Go to ziyara, go to umrah, go to hajj. Because what? This is a form of relief, a stress reliever. And then he says, likewise, you find that when you travel, sometimes you can make money, you can make your living. Sometimes in the business trips. And then the imam says, when you travel, sometimes you will gain knowledge. Sometimes you will be exposed to other cultures, which is also good. It makes you more what's humble. It makes you more accepting and tolerant of other cultures. And finally, the Imam says, وَصُحْبَةُ majidi. Sometimes some individuals, you discover them when you what? When you travel with them. You discover that they are gems. 20 years in my city, I never had such a good friend. I travel one trip. I go to Toronto. I go to Vancouver. I go to, for example, Umrah. I go to Karbala. I go to Najaf. In that trip, I realize that this person is a gem. That's why when I travel sometimes, I see some friends. They live in the same city. They tell me, Sayyid, you know how we became best buddies? We live in the same city. It's not here. We we went to a ziyara trip. We went to Hajj, and this is when we discovered each other. So when you travel, this is when you discover the true nature of people.
So the Imam says, Suhbat Majid, how do you know someone is Majid, someone is truly noble? It's when you travel. The Imam could also mean that sometimes when you're looking for a spouse, you don't have to stick to your city, correct? He says, Safar, there are benefits to, uh, to traveling that sometimes you can find your spouse when you travel, correct? Doesn't have to be in the city. Go one week, 10 days, spend in a community that there are Muslims, and maybe you can search amongst there. I remember couple of years ago, there was a brother who was trying to get married. For years, he couldn't get married. Finally, one day he says, Sayyid, Alhamdulillah, I have found the girl of my dreams and I want to marry her. How did you get to know her? This is not a joke. This is real. He says through social media, through the internet, I got to know her. But Alhamdulillah, for months we have been interacting and I have asked her so many questions. We became friends and I know that she is the one that is right for me. I say, Alhamdulillah, Mabrook. This young man is fairly wealthy. This young man is fairly wealthy. So he tells me that I am going to Dubai for my honeymoon. And then he sends me a message. He tells me, Sayyid, a couple of days after my honeymoon in Dubai, I want to set up a Zoom call with you. I want you to give us some advice. Me and my wife, I want you to give us some advice for newlyweds. And I told him, no problem, inshallah. So we set an appointment, let's say Saturday, 12 p.m. We're supposed to meet and I give them some advice for newlyweds. Friday night, he sends me a message. He tells me, Sayyid, I'm sorry, the meeting is canceled. Why? I'll explain later. Okay, I didn't say anything. Months later, he calls me one day and he says, Sayyid, uh, do you know anyone that I can marry? Tell him, didn't you just come back from your honeymoon in Dubai? He says, Sayyid, I did go to the honeymoon in Dubai, but I left my wife in Dubai. Why? He says, because my honeymoon is where I divorced her. I told him, why? He said, because I realized that she's a gold digger. You know what a gold digger means? Ask your children. Someone that what? Just looks for money. She saw pictures or he told her of his car. He has a very nice Porsche car, correct? And that he is wealthy and he makes this much. And she was the best actor in pretending that she loved him. He says, when I traveled and I went to Dubai, I realized that she doesn't love me. Her love is not genuine. This is a gold digger. So that's why the honeymoon ended in what? Ended in divorce. When you travel with someone, no matter how many times you have met that person, when you travel, this is when you see the true colors. And that's why they say someone was about to have his 10th anniversary of his marriage. So someone comes and asks him, he tells him, you know what? What's the recipe of, of your success in your marriage? Because we never find... You fighting with your wife, you're never, all of us, we come back, we're stressed from our wives and this and that, and we have problems. But Enta, you never have any problem. What's the, what's, the, what's the key? Teach us. What do you do? So he said, you know what? I travel. I take my wife and I travel with her. They said, tell us examples. He said, yes, it all began with the honeymoon. For the honeymoon, I took my wife to the Maldives. Maldives, mashallah. He says, yes, so I always travel. So they told him, your 10th anniversary, well, where will you go? He said, I'll go back to the Maldives. Why Maldives once again? He said, so that I can go and bring her back from the Maldives. Meaning he had left her from the honeymoon. So some of our youth brothers and sisters, from day one, you start, you, you, it starts very rocky, correct? Why? Because it's all acting before that. And this, is when they, and this is when they realize the true personality of that person. So the Imam says, you want to discover the personality of someone, Suhbatu Majid? This can happen through traveling. So this is the first lesson we learn from Sayyidah Khadija alayhi salam with respect to marriage. Number one, look for the reputation. Number two, investigate, not just khira and istikhara and number three if you can even test that person through money and through traveling so now that Muhammad is back Khadija knows that this person is right for her she starts to fall in love with him after everything she had heard about him some reports indicate that she had a friend by the name of Nafisa Nafisa bint Umayya or bint Munya two names that have been mentioned she tells her friend Nafisa to go to Muhammad and tell him that I'm interested in him, but indirectly. Nafisa goes to Muhammad after the trip. Ya Muhammad, you're 25 years old. You're not married. Why do you not get married? He says, who should I get married to? She tells him, if I suggest the name of someone who has beauty, nobility, akhlaq, 
and she has what and she has wealth everything you can imagine a woman will you accept he says of course who she tells him Khadija he says Khadija Khadija will accept me Khadija Abu Jahl and Abu Sufyan and the millionaires and the big dignitaries of Quraysh were being rejected so Rasulullah told her Khadija will accept me she said yes Khadija has sent me Khadija has shown interest in you ya Muhammad so come and propose to her if you accept Look at the lesson that Khadija teaches us, brothers and sisters. This is the second lesson. In our cultures, it's always the man has to come and show interest to the girl. Correct? The girl has to sit like a princess and wait for the khattaba, as we say, to come and show interest. Such that in our community, sometimes it is even aib. It is shameful for the woman, for the girl to show interest. Is it? Isn't it in our culture like this? If the girl comes to her father and she says, you know, there's a young man, they say he's a mu'min, I'm interested in He may slap her in her face. This is haram. But look, Khadija alayhi salam, she's the one that's initiated. Many fathers, they think that if they initiate, they go and tell some young man, you don't have to make it very obvious, indirectly send someone that this is what, that this means my daughter is unworthy, correct? If I want to respect my daughter and she is Aziza, Ghalia, Thamina, as we say, then people have to come and show interest. I cannot go and show interest. This is all against the teachings of Ahlul Bayt. Where do we learn this from? Brothers and sisters, Khadija shows that even a woman, she can go if she sees someone noble, mu'min, honest, <clears throat> worthy of marriage, she can go and show the interest. There's nothing wrong with that. It is not aib. But subhanallah, do we follow Ahlul Bayt salam, or do we follow our own jahiliya customs? Subhanallah. And that's why when you go to the Arabic countries, the Muslim countries, you will find so many girls that become anas. Anas is when she reaches the age, but she can't get married. She's 30, 35. Why? Because she cannot show interest in anyone. And they have to come. Sometimes people don't come. And to go, what's the problem? You the father go, you the brother go, you the uncle. You see someone who's a mu'min and you can tell him, look, you can come and propose. What's wrong with that? Is that aib? Is that shameful? Never. This is the second lesson that Khadija alayhi salam shows us, brothers and sisters. I as a father, I have a daughter. I don't have to wait for people to come like a king. I'm a king. I'm a prince. My daughter is a princess. No, no. You can go if you find someone good. Because many times you'll see some people who are gems. You know they are gems. But what? They may not come. Because maybe they are afraid that if they come and they propose to my daughter, I will reject. So maybe he's interested, but he's shy to come. So you go out and you tell him, what's the problem? <clears throat> so this is when Rasulullah, he decides to come to propose to Khadija. Rasulullah comes with whom? The hadith of Al-Imam al-Sadiq explains it. This is mentioned in the book of Al-Kafi. Al-Imam al-Sadiq is narrated saying, the Holy Prophet goes to his uncle Abu Talib. He goes to his uncle Abu Talib that Khadija has shown interest. Khadija is a noble woman. Everyone would die to marry Khadija. Abu Talib sees it's a beautiful idea. He says, yes, my dear nephew, this is a good idea. So Abu Talib, <clears throat> excuse me, Abu Talib comes with Rasulullah. Some of the family members of Rasulullah, some of Bani Hashim, and some of the people of Quraysh. So it, it was an entire delegation that came to the house of Khadija. Some reports indicate it was her uncle, other her cousin, but most likely it was her uncle because her father, Khwailid, had already died. So they come to the house of Khadija, Abu Talib alayhi salam. He represents the father of Rasulullah. So they come and they sit down. Al-Imam al-Sadiq tells us what Abu Talib said. Abu Talib begins by glorifying Allah. And this is 15 years before Islam begins. Abu Talib begins his beautiful khutbah that all Muslims narrate. You will find it, for example, Ibn al-Jawzi narrates it in his book. You will find Muhibb al-Din al-Tabari narrates it in his book. And you find the book of Al-Kafi, Imam al-Sadiq narrates it also. Abu Talib, he begins by glorifying Allah. He says, Alhamdulillah alladhi ja'alana min dhurriyati Ismail wa Ibrahim. He says, I praise Allah Azza wa Jal, the Lord of the Kaaba, who has made us, Bani Hashim, the children of Ibrahim and the children of Ismail. So he begins by glorifying Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I thank Allah, I praise Him for making our city Mecca a holy city.
city وَجَعَلَ مَكَّةَ بَلَدًا آمِنًا I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for this. This khutbah in itself, brothers and sisters, proves that Abu Talib was never a mushrik. You know why? This is 15 years before Islam. Because if imagine Abu Talib was a mushrik and he believed in those idols, why didn't he invoke the name of those idols? You are doing a nikah, a ketb a marriage. You want the gods to bless this marriage. And Muhammad is not a messenger yet. So you could say, for example, Muhammad has said, no, I only believe in Allah. Muhammad's still not a messenger. He's still not sent by Allah. So why didn't he not begin with the name of Allah and then Hubal, Wallat, Wal Uzza, Wa Manat? Why didn't he not invoke their names and ask for their blessings? Because he was a muwahid from day one. Even before Islam came, Abu Talib was a muwahid. And this khutbah in itself proves that Abu Talib was a muwahid. So the first thing that Abu Talib says, he praises Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And then Abu Talib, he begins to speak about Rasulullah, his nephew. He says, and this nephew of mine, Muhammad, there is no one in Quraysh greater than him. You cannot compare anyone to my nephew Muhammad. Yes, maybe he does not have money. Maybe he is not wealthy. But money comes and goes. Money comes and goes. But what Muhammad does have is something greater than money. And that is akhlaq. His character, his nobility, his akhlaq. You find his personality, it is unmatched. This is lesson three. For us brothers and sisters from the marriage of Rasulullah and Khadija. Abu Talib is telling us a message that what? Many people, when they want to get married, they look in the son-in-law, money, money, money. Correct? Abu Talib says money comes and goes. If he's not rich today, he can be rich tomorrow. I know many couples, now they're married. When they started, they were not wealthy. They were very average. Now, mashallah, they're millionaires. The husband is a millionaire. And I know the opposite. I know couples that got married. They were very well off. Now they live off the welfare. So don't just look at the money. It's just the money, money. Rasulullah, Abu Talib says about Rasulullah, maybe you see him now, he doesn't have money, but money comes and goes. What he does have is akhlaq. Akhlaq, if it's there, it will stay. Money comes and goes, but akhlaq, if it's there, it will not go. And if it's not there, it will never come, brothers and sisters. So ask for something. Look for something that is permanent, that you can guarantee and rely on. And that is the akhlaq. Muhammad is what someone that has akhlaq and he will have the akhlaq till the rest of his life. And this is something that where we lack, brothers and sisters. A brother tells me once that I go to propose. I go to the family and I propose from the father. He says the father only had two questions. Number one, how much money do I make? My career. And number two, subhanAllah, which village do I come from? Before it used to be which country, but because both of them are from the same country, which village do you come from? He says he did not ask me about my deen, about my salah, do I drink, do I not drink, do I pay my hummus, not pay my zakat. He did not even care about my akhlaq, do I have anger issues, do I have depression? Money and which village? And this is a mentality that many of us Muslims have, brothers and sisters, unfortunately. Abu Talib, alayhi salam, he's showing that money comes and goes. Money may not always bring happiness. Money is good. We're not saying money is not important. Career is not important. But don't just look at the career. Sometimes you see he comes with a Porsche. Khalas. Yes, automatic. Yes. Ask about his akhlaq. Ask about his deen. That's why Rasulullah said, إِذَا جَاءَكُمْ مَنْ تَرْضَوْنَ دِينَهُ وَخُلُقَهْ فَزَوَّجُهُ if someone comes and you know their deen is good, their religion and their akhlaq, their personality, their character is good, this is when you say, okay. So you want to ask about the career, you have the right to do that. Of course, I don't want to marry my daughter to a homeless man. But ask about his deen. Many fathers, many mothers, they don't care about the deen. They don't care about the akhlaq. It's just the money. This will not bring you happiness, brothers and sisters. There's a alim who told me the story. He says, that a girl comes one day and she tells me, Sayyid, I want an appointment. He says, I know she's a very noble girl, good girl in the community, very good family. I asked, who is it? She wants an appointment for the Katsbik Tap. She says, it is Fulan. He says, I know Fulan. Fulan is not a good person. His family is not that good. And he himself, I have heard a lot of bad things about. So I told her, my dear daughter, I think there are better people. 
I think there are better people. Maybe this is not a good idea. And you know, this is one of those exceptions where you are allowed to do ghibah. If someone asks you about someone, then you're allowed, even if you're not asked, you're just told this person is married, you're allowed to go and say, this is not a good person. You don't have to give details. But at least what you show that person that this is probably not the best person for you. Even though that this is exposing, but because you are doing it to save the marriage, then you're allowed to do it. So he says, this alam, I told her, this is not the right person. But she said, no, I am in love with him. I want to marry him. The alam says, I know why. Because he drives a Porsche. He's wealthy, very wealthy. He's very handsome and charming. MashaAllah, he comes and he charms you with his talk and his speech. But I know there is no deen and no akhlaq. I told her, my dear daughter, think about it again. Are you sure this is the right person? No, 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 I want to marry. And sometimes, subhanAllah, you know, when you fall in love, these young people, khalas ba'at. No matter what you tell them, it enters one ear and it comes out the other ear. That's why there's a famous Arabic expression, Sahibul al hajati a'ma, la yara illa qadaha. And especially when you are someone that is in love, wa'aynu al-rida an kulli aybin kalilatun. The, the poet says that when you fall in love with someone, that's it, you don't see anymore. You become blinded by the love. And this is an, even an expression in English that love blinds. He says that she kept on insisting. I said, fine, but I did what I have to do. I gave her the warning. She did not heed to the warning. I did the Ketub Iktab, they had the, the, the wedding. He says, two months later, two months later, she calls me crying. Say it. What is it? Come and see what my husband, what I just discovered. What happened? He got into an accident. Alhamdulillah. Now, I don't know if she said Alhamdulillah. Maybe she said, unfortunately, he did not die. But I was called to the scene because I'm the wife. And I see he is what? Arrested because he is drunk and driving. So I realized that he's drinking and that's not where it stops. So I took his phone and I realized that he has affairs with three other girls. Three other girls. On the same day, I realized that he drinks and what? He's pulled over and arrested for drinking and driving. I realized he has three affairs at once. Ya Sayyid, what should I do? He says, I told you so. Basinti ba'd, you were so... You were so stubborn. You didn't want to listen. Didn't I tell you? Wallahi, if that, if, the, if that man has millions of dollars, what will his money do if he comes at night and he's drunk? He does not fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He comes and he abuses the daughter. He has affairs with other women. What will that help? What will that money help my daughter if he has all that money? Nothing, brothers and sisters. And that's why there's a hadith from the Prophet where he says, he's narrated saying, مَنْ زَوَّجَ ابْنَتَهُ لِشَارِبِ خَمْرٍ فَقَدْ قَطَعَ رَحِمًا If you know that he drinks, the son-in-law, and you still accept because, wallah, he has a nice house, because he has the fancy car, then it's as if you have severed your relationship with your daughter, as if you have sold your daughter, as if you have disowned your daughter. So look for the Iman, brothers and sisters. Look for the Akhlaq. This is a lesson that Abu Talib teaches us. And there is also, SubhanAllah, we talk about religion. There's also a study that I read, Emory University. Google it. You can Google it, Emory University of Atlanta. They did a study. They found out that a woman who cared about the wealth of their husband, they, were, they had a 60% higher chance of getting into a divorce versus the woman who did not care about the wealth. It was about the akhlaq. It was about the personality. So Islam says it. The Quran says it. The Prophet says it. Ahlul Bayt says it. And now scientists are discovering it. So the second thing Abu Talib shows is that Muhammad may not have money, but he has akhlaq, and this is what you should seek. And then Abu Talib says, I will pay the mahar. Do not worry about the mahar, I will pay it. So then Imam al-Sadiq says in the hadith, the uncle or whoever it may have been representing Khadija, when he was supposed to reply, because of the eloquence and the aura, the hayba of Abu Talib and Rasulullah, he could not talk. He started to stutter and tremble. He started to tremble and stutter. So Khadija, she came and she told her uncle, my dear uncle, please allow me to speak. I have accepted. I accept that Muhammad is my husband. And I tell you, Ya Abba Talib, there is no need for the dowry. Whatever you set at the, at the dowry, as the dowry, I will take care of it. So basically, I will forfeit it. This is another lesson that we learn. If you see a young man that may not have so much, he has the akhlaq. Do not make the dowry an, as an obstacle. We hear this many, many times, brothers and sisters, from the ahadith of Ahlul Bayt. But practically, unfortunately, we do not apply it. 
That's why the hadith of Rasulullah says, خَيْرُ نِسَاءُ أُمَّتِي أَقَلُّهُنَّ مُهُورًا The best women of my nation are the ones that request the least amount of mahar. Khadija alayha salam, she says, Asan, I'll take care of the mahar. Don't worry about the mahar. Why? Because I have found someone who is a jewel, who is a gem, who cares about the mahar when you have Rasulullah himself is the treasure. You look for money? You think money will bring you the happiness? <clears throat> this is where the hadith of the Imam says, some of the people of Quraysh who were attending, they became envious that Muhammad, now he's going to be the husband of Khadija, the wealthy, and he doesn't even have to pay mahar. So they say, wow, now the women have to pay mahar. huh? From now on, women have to pay mahar? So they're mocking Rasulullah. This is when Abu Talib is angry. And he says, إِذَا كَانَ الرَّجُلْ مِثْلَ ابْنَ أَخِي if it was a man like my nephew Muhammad, فَتُدْفَعْ إِلَيْهِ أَعْظَمُ الْأَمْوَالِ وَأَعْظَمُ الْمُهُورِ If it is a man like Muhammad, a gem like Muhammad, yes, he is to be paid. He's not the one that pays. Meaning don't make money an obstacle. It doesn't matter. Even if he gives you nothing as a mahar, his akhlaq is more than you can ask for. And if he has no akhlaq, but he gives you millions, you still have not gained anything, brothers and sisters. We have to change our perspective. Abu Talib says, Muhammad has something greater than money. So if it is someone like my nephew Muhammad who has akhlaq, then of course, women were to pay him. But if it is imbeciles like you, as we say, huthalat like you, he was telling those Quraysh, the people of Quraysh who were, who were uh, objecting, if it is people, imbeciles like you, then you pay the highest mahar and yet women would say no. So we cannot generalize. It depends on the person. This is a lesson that we learn, brothers and sisters. If a young man comes, he has deen, he has akhlaq, he's trying to get a career, he is studying, he is working. Don't make the mahar an obstacle. You want to write it something, fine. But like Abu Talib said, I will take care of the mahar. Khadija says, I take care of the mahar. What's the problem if the father-in-law takes care of the mahar? This is not aib. Once again, this is from Jahiliya, Abu Talib, Khadija, Rasulullah. Their teaching is, this is not aib. There is nothing wrong with this. And this is where you find this beautiful matrimony between Khadija and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam begins. And they had the most beautiful marriage, the most beautiful relationship that every single one of us should inspire and look up to, that every single one of us should want, the relationship between Khadija and Rasulullah, a relationship of love and respect. Let me read you some poetry that is Attribute it to Khadija. Look at how she saw Muhammad. Look at how she saw Rasulullah. <coughs> She's narrated saying, فَلَوْ أَنَّنِي أَمْسَيْتُ فِي كُلِّ نِعْمَةٍ وَدَامَتْ لِيَ الدُّنْيَا وَمُلْكُ الْأَكَاسِرَةِ فَمَا سُوِّيَتْ عَنْدِي جَنَاحَ بَعُوضَةٍ إِذَا لَمْ تَكُنْ عَيْنِي لِعَيْنِكَ نَاظِرَةٍ الله أكبر. Talk about, you know, when we say غزل, when we talk about beautiful poem between someone who, between someone that they love, look at this beautiful poem of Khadija to Rasulullah. She says that if I have all the money of the world, I have everything because she was a millionaire. And I have more than that. I own the entire world. This is nothing if I don't have you, O oh Muhammad. Without you, it's meaningless. One look I see in your eyes is worth than the entire dunya. How many of us brothers and sisters see our spouses in that way, where I can tell her one look in your eye, it is worth than the entire world, brothers and sisters, where I can tell my wife this or my wife can tell me this. This was the beautiful relationship between Rasulullah and Khadija alayhi salam. And that's why Rasulullah loved Khadija so much. When Khadija died, he would always remember Khadija. وَمَنْ مِثْلُ Khadija. She gave me everything. When everyone abandoned me, she supported me. When everyone denied me their wealth, she gave me her wealth so that I would spread Islam. When all the other wives did not give me children she gave me Fatima alayha salam she is the one that gave and sacrificed everything that she had for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi wa sallam so anytime he would hear the name of Khadija you would see the tears of Rasulullah come down on his cheeks and on a night like this the 10th night of Ramadan that we will enter Khadija alayha salam was on her deathbed. Rasulullah would lose amongst his greatest companions, amongst his greatest supporters, the one that always supported, consoled Rasulullah when he comes back 
and the people of Quraysh, they would bother him, they would throw rocks at him, they would hurt his feelings, they would physically hurt him. It was Khadija to protect him and console him and treat the wounds. On a night like this, Khadija is on her deathbed. It's her final moment. She wants to tell her final wills to Rasulullah. It is reported that she asked for her daughter Fatima alayhi salam to come. Fatima is four to five years old. She's a young daughter. She comes to her mother. My dear mother, what do you need? She tells her, I want you to go and make a request from your father Rasulullah because I am embarrassed. She says, what is it, my dear mother? I want you to ask the shirt of Rasulullah, al-qamis, alladhi kana yalbasuhu Rasulullah, the one that he used to pray with, the one that he used to supplicate to Allah with and read Quran. I want his qamis to be my kafan in my grave. So please go and ask Rasulullah. Fatima, imagine a four or five-year-old daughter. She goes to Rasulullah and she asks Rasulullah, my dear father, this is the request of my mother. Rasulullah says, of course, I accept. So he gives the shirt and it becomes the kafan of a Sayyida Khadija alayhi salam. It's, it's reported that after that, who came? Asma came and she saw Asma crying. So she asked him, Ya Umm al Mu'mineen, why are you crying in these final moments? Is it because you are dying and you are afraid? She says, No, because every time I see my daughter Fatima, I remember that I will leave an orphan after me. A four or five year old daughter or Fatima alayhi salam. Who will take care of my daughter Fatima? Every time I am looking and seeing Fatima, my daughter, I will remember that she will be lonely after me. I remember the day that she will get married. She will look left and right and she will not find her mother besides her because every girl when she gets married obviously she is honored to have her to have her mother besides her to support her to teach her to guide her but I am remembering on the day of the wedding of my daughter Fatima who is the one that will be there for her Allahu Akbar you see how Khadija she is worried about her daughter Fatima alayhi salam and how she will be an orphan and that's why I read a hadith from al Imam al-Sadiq alayhi salam where he says hey حينما ماتت خديجة كانت فاطمة عليها السلام تلوذ برسول الله وتقول له أين أمي فاطمة أين أمي خديجة أين أمي خديجة The Imam says that when خديجة died فاطمة as a young girl she would come and she would spin around رسول الله and she would what stick to رسول الله كانت تلوذ برسول الله and she would cry and say, where is my mother Khadija? I want my mother Khadija. Allahu Akbar. How you see Fatima alayha salam. <clears throat> she was an orphan, four or five years old. And how subhanallah, the days went and came back. And the same thing happened to her daughter. Zainab alayha salam became an orphan that Fatima alayha salam loved. It is reported that Imam Ali was on the grave of Fatima alayha salam. He is what? He is reciting Quran as Fatima had requested. All of a sudden in the middle of the night he remembers that what Hassan, Hussein and Zainab they're alone in the house. So he gets up quickly, he goes back to the house. Who does he see? He sees his daughter Zainab is crying all alone in a corner. <laughs> Amir al Mu'mineen goes to Zainab, he tells her, My dear daughter Zainab, why are you crying? She says, Because I woke up, I did not find my mother Fatima besides me. You would imagine I go to Amir al Mu'mineen and he would comfort me, but I did not find you, Ya Ali, neither. <laughs> مدن أي منقلب ينقلبون والعاقبة للمتقين نسألك اللهم وندعوك باسمك العظيم الأعظم العزل جل الأكرم يا الله everyone together يا الله 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 اللهم اغفر للمؤمنين والمؤمنات الأحياء منهم والأموات اللهم عجل لولي الفرج واجعلنا من أنصاره وأعوانه والمستشهدين بين يديه وإلى أرواح المؤمنين والمؤمنات نهدي لهم جميعا ثواب الفاتحة مع الصلوات